Thank you so much, Agnes. So I'm going to share my screen. We all practiced this yesterday. I've got my talk ready. So I just do that and do that, I think, and share. And hopefully you can see a picture of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. So I'm here. Um, the indigenous owners of the land where I am um, in Sydney's inner west are the Gadigal people and uh, they lived on these lands but I can tell you today it's cold and uh, wet in Sydney. So I'm going to talk about, it's quarter past, I'll talk about for 25 minutes uh, about uh, the work. Now I've just, yeah, so I want to tell you about this long road to better therapies for sickle cell I'm sorry it's taking for so long. Scientists have been interested in this topic for a long time, but it's turned out to be harder. I put that picture of an obstacle course. It would be easy to do that obstacle course as an adult, but in the world of understanding molecular genetics, we're like infants and it's proven to be very hard, but we are getting closer. And what I want to explain to you this evening is the pathway towards a cure uh, I want to give you a sense of the history, uh, some of the people and the path, and to show you what has been happening and is happening across the world, and also to explain what's happening in Australia. So many people, I've even heard, I've heard sickle cell being called a rare disease or a, a, not a, a, a well-known disease, but it is actually to scientists. And I point out, as Agnes said, I'm a scientist, not a clinician, but to scientists, it's the most famous inherited disease of all. And it's become very famous because it has been a topic that some wonderful scientists have worked on. And I've shown some of this on this slide, and it gives you the impression you can even tell from the black and white photographs, uh, how people have worked on this for many years. Linus Pauling, uh, who was unusual in winning two Nobel Prizes, one for chemistry and one for peace. Uh, he uh, was the first person to describe sickle cell as a molecular disease. Uh, Max Perutz and John Kendrew solved the structure of hemoglobin, the molecule which is mutated in sickle cell, and they won the Nobel Prize. Fred Sanger, uh, his sequencing method was used to sequence the DNA change. You'll know it's uh, the disease, inherited diseases caused by one DNA change. He won the Nobel Prize. Janet Watson, she worked in um, New York and she made an absolutely important observation about fetal hemoglobin, which is a, a different type of globin that you have when you're a baby in your mother's womb. And it has high binding to oxygen and allows the baby to take the oxygen out of the mother's blood into the baby's body. And she found out that some people have more of this fetal hemoglobin and they have milder effects of sickle cell. I'll come back to that point. The next picture is Francis Collins who led the Human Genome Project and he worked on sickle cell. Andy Fire and Craig Mello won the Nobel Prize for turning genes off and their work central to the story tonight. Stu Orkin is next. This year, he won the King Faisal Prize, which is one of the most prestigious prizes in science. And he spent his life working on sickle cell. I'll tell you about his work. And then we have Emmanuel Charpentier, uh, Virginia Sixnus, and Jennifer Doudna. And Emmanuel Charpentier is an inventor of CRISPR. And uh, their, their first clinical trial is on sickle cell. So on the next slide, I just show that uh, um, the people in red there, uh, have won Nobel Prizes. So work on hemoglobins and on sickle cell has been among the most important work in the world. And it started so long ago. If you see the picture on the right, that's from George Gulliver's book, where he went around, he was a retired soldier. In 1846, he went around London Zoo, collected blood from different animals and looked at it under the microscope. And the blood cells are so different, uh, very, very different. Different uh, types of animal have very different blood. And he was the first who observed uh, sickle-shaped blood cells in deer. Uh, and deer don't suffer diseases from that, but those were the first sickle cells ever seen. But then the history goes further. In 1910, so that's 110 years ago, James Herrick, 
of Chicago observed the first sickle cells in a blood film on a glass glass slide of a medical student who was studying there in Chicago, uh, a medical student from Granada who had sickle cell disease. Uh, it was uh, 1949, Linus Pauling realized it was a molecular disease due to a single change in a single gene uh, changing the protein hemoglobin, which carries oxygen around the blood. Another uh, nearly 10 years go by, eight years go by, uh, and Vernon Ingram defines the exact change in the hemoglobin protein. A few more years, Max Brutz and John Kendrew solve the exact structure of hemoglobin. Fred Sanger's sequencing, another nearly 20 years later, identifies the precise mutation and Fred Sanger won the Nobel Prize. He also won two Nobel Prizes. Uh, and then just a couple of years ago, the geneticists, now that human genetics with the human genome has become so important, worked out that this mutation arose 260 generations ago, 7,000 years ago in Africa. And if you had one copy of the sickle cell gene, you had less severe malaria but two copies and you had sickle cell disorder. So all of this work over this time was extremely important, but it didn't help us to provide a cure. But the cl clinical observations did suggest treatments. So I mentioned Janet Watson. She noticed that children had fewer symptoms than adults. And she attributed this to the fact that children still have a little bit of fetal hemoglobin that's that high affinity globin that binds oxygen tightly that's found in babies and allows the baby to take the oxygen from the mother's blood. And this observation, she was extraordinary that she worked this out. It changed the whole direction of research. And so that's why I've said, I've gotten this slide. Yes, humans have different globin genes, those active in utero, which bind oxygen tightly and those turned on later. And some people have slightly higher levels of fetal hemoglobin throughout their whole life and they have mild sickle cell symptoms. And so scientists said, well, if we could turn on this fetal hemoglobin gene or even just increase its expression a bit, that would be a treatment for the disease. And George Stamatoinopoulos, he, he and his wife Thalia came from Greece where there was much thalassemia, a disease like sickle cell. And he dedicated his life uh, to uh, raising funds and doing research. He was a great scientist on sickle cell and he had a conference where everyone in the field goes every two years. And people discovered drugs that do uh, increase the level of this fetal hemoglobin, this superglobin. Uh, a DNA demethylating agent, 5-azocytosine works, but it is associated with changes in DNA and could cause cancer. So it's never been used in humans. Uh, but other drugs, called cytotoxic drugs, which change the blood stem cells, and hydroxyurea is one, that uh, does turn on fetal globin, and that's widely used. Uh, it is under medical supervision. It's a safe drug to use. Um, all drugs can have side effects, but it's a, it's a recommended treatment, and I believe it's used widely. But no one knows how these drugs work, and they don't work equally well on all patients. And because we don't know how they work, we don't know how to make them better. So those were great. Uh, that was a great drug developed in the 80s, but um, it hasn't really been improved on dramatically. So scientists went back to the bench and just said, we're going to learn everything we possibly can about hemoglobin. They studied the genes. Any of you who've studied biology might have learned about promoters and enhancers. Uh, the, the control regions of genes. You might have learned about poly A sites, the endpoints of genes. These were all characterized studying the hemoglobin genes. If you've done a lot of molecular biology, you've learned about histo modifications, hypersensitive site, master regulators, pseudo genes, splice site mutations. All was discovered in the globins. So the globins was a, a tremendously exciting area to work with. But all this knowledge, we hoped would provide a cure, but it didn't provide a cure. And for 30 years or so, molecular biologists worked, but we weren't closer to a cure. Then this uh, wonderful woman in London now works in NIH in Washington, Swile Thane, took a different approach. She realized the human genome had been sequenced 
and many people were having their DNA sequence and you could analyze many different families. And she said, we know that some people have more fetal globin expressed. I wonder if there are particular DNA variants which correlate or cause extra fetal globin. And uh, she found one, BC11A. Uh, changes in BC11A increased fetal globin. And my super, former supervisor in Harvard uh, mutated the BC11A gene in a mouse and fetal globin was suddenly turned on. And this was a wonderful moment. This was a eureka moment. People realized if you can inactivate BC11A, you can turn the fetal globin on. So if we can change the BC11A gene or we can find a drug, that could be a cure. And this was only uh, less than 10 years ago. The whole field shifted pace and we said, now we know BC11A is the answer. It sits on the fetal globin gene and turns it off. I'll explain that in a minute. And we all switched to trying to turn the BC11A gene off. And you might be thinking, well, why didn't we just turn the fetal globin gene on? It's so much easier in biology to break something and turn it off than to turn something on. So I say, if me or anyone here wanted to work on my car or bike, It'd be easy to make it go slower, very hard to make it go faster. But now we had a target, which we just had to knock out. And Stu Orkin's lab in Boston with um, David Williams, only a couple of years ago now, about three years ago, started using this small RNA uh, technique that Fire and Mello won the Nobel Prize for in 2006, and said, if we can put this small RNA into cells, and turn off the BC11A gene, the fetal globin gene will come on. And they've got a, an extensive clinical trial going on in Boston, and the results are very promising. Now, you need to be a molecular biologist to understand this slide, but this is, a, this is how small RNAs are made. You have to put in a gene therapy vector into the blood stem cells. It makes this RNA. This RNA binds to the BC11A RNA and stops the BC11A being made. So all that was happening, uh, but something else was happening. CRISPR gene editing had been invented. I won't explain everything about it, but it was a way uh, developed from a bacterial system where we can change individual human genes. And so the first thing people tried is, can we change the sickle cell mutation back? But it turned out that CRISPR works very well in some cells and not other, others. And just by bad luck, it needs to cut and then repair. And the repair pathways don't work very well in blood stem cells. I wanted to show the pictures of the people who um, developed CRISPR. I think they will win the Nobel Prize, uh, but they haven't yet. Emmanuel Charpentier, Virginia Sickness, and Jennifer Doudna um, developed CRISPR. And what they are trying to do, again, how do we stop BC11A? What they're doing here is using CRISPR to disrupt the on switch for BC11A, and that will stop BC11A being able to repress the globin genes. But what was I doing all this time in my lab in Australia? So we were also interested in 1948, Janet Watson had said children have fewer symptoms. Uh, then in 1958, people had found some patients who had really high levels of fetal hemoglobin. It was called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin, a completely benign condition, but these people just had more hemoglobin. And sequencing done by Francis Collin of the, of the Human Genome Project found the mutation was in the actual fetal globin control region. And he worked on these mutations, but he couldn't find out how they worked. But we started working on them. And there's lots of families, and these are just some families' trees, of people who have mutations in their fetal globin gene. And they have, and the gene is on throughout their life. So Alistair Fennell, who's worked in my lab, but now has gone to John Stam's lab, the son of um, George Stamatoinopoulos in Seattle. And uh, Bika Wiener came from Germany, and Gabby Martin uh, is a, a Sydney a uh, PhD student, and they all worked in my lab in this building at UNSW Sydney. And we did a very simple thing. We said those mutations at the beginning of the fetal globin gene, I wonder if a repressor binds 
and we said to Gabby, um, see if you can find out what their repressor is. Test every known DNA binding protein you can. And there's Gabby at the bench uh, beginning to do this. And in the first experiment, now this is an experiment where we have a piece of DNA at the bottom and we add different proteins. And when you add BC11A, it binds to the beginning of the fetal globin gene. And suddenly everything made sense. Up till this moment, no one knew how BC11A turned off the fetal globin gene, but now we knew it bound directly to the beginning of the fetal globin gene, sat on it, stopped the gene from coming on. And uh, that, was, that was a hugely important result for us. And those mutations that Francis Collins had discovered initially, each of those mutations in those different families, those mutations stop BC11A binding. So in most people, BC11A binds to the site. If you make a mutation, you don't see that black band because the mutation has changed the shape of the DNA so that BC11A no longer binds. And so we said, what if we use CRISPR not to interfere with BC11A, but just to interfere with the fetal globin gene? Will the fetal globin gene turn on? And that's shown in this very complicated slide. Here's the, here's the fetal globin gene. Here's the guides that you use to send CRISPR to the beginning of the gene. And here's the data. Normal cells have very little fetal globin, but if you make those mutations, you get a large amount of fetal globin. And this is a particular experiment that shows just how much you get. So what a simple result. BC11A binds to this region. And uh, what that means is if you disrupt that using CRISPR, you, can, um, you could alleviate the disease. And so uh, this is being done in France, in the US, and we're talking to a biotech company about how best to do this. But there's more. People kept saying, why work on the fetal globin gene? Why not just repair the sickle cell mutation? And as I explained, we can't do that because you have to cut and repair, and that doesn't work in blood stem cells. And then this wonderful scientist, David Liu at Harvard, I follow David on Twitter, actually. He's one of the best commentators on the coronavirus, too. Um, he's well worth following. Um, he invented a new way to change DNA called base editing. And here on the front page of science, it says new prime editing, uh, which is even better than base editing, uh, could surpass CRISPR. The first base editing could change many, many different letters of DNA into other letters, but it couldn't, just by bad luck again, change the sickle cell mutation. But now David has invented prime editing, which is a mechanism for changing any letters you like in DNA. And I'm very optimistic that in the future, you'll be able to change the sickle cell mutation back in blood stem cells. So with that optimism, you'll probably be sitting there thinking, well, if we can change that DNA, why don't we just do it? And it's important I explain to you that changing humans is really, really hard. And it's hard for two simple reasons. We have trillions of cells. If you want to change a human, you have to change every cell or at least every blood stem cell to ensure that the future blood is changed permanently. And the other thing is our cells don't welcome new DNA. Our cells are surrounded by membranes that prevent DNA getting in. And if DNA does get in, and you know what a virus is, is just a little package of DNA. Excuse me, if, if DNA gets in, our cells treat that DNA like a possible virus and silence it as fast as they can. And so to get DNA in, you have to take bone marrow out of the patient, grow them in a, a flask. You have to add the CRISPR base editors into the cells, which is not easy to do. And then you have to check that they've done their job and then you have to transplant the bone marrow back in. So it's a, it involves essentially a bone marrow transplant out of someone and then back in, which is complicated. So is there a better way? So some researchers are saying, is it possible 
to do in vivo CRISPR based editing? Could we just inject CRISPR into someone's arm and let it find its way around the body and edit the right cells? Now that sort of experiment, there's evidence that might work in a mouse. You need to have a lot more of it in humans and no one knows whether that is safe or effective. So that is not available as a therapy at the moment. But one day I believe it is possible that it could be done safely, but it, a lot of testing will have to be done first. But there's another idea, which I'm actually most excited about. And it's to say, yes, we can inactivate BC11A with a small RNA. We can inactivate BC11A with a CRISPR uh, gene editing molecule. But why don't we just see if we can find a drug that binds to BC11A and turns it off? So people are trying to do that, but no one's been success to, successful. But a friend of mine who was also a postdoc with me in Harvard in the um, early 90s, he said, I'm not, it's hard to make a drug against um, a DNA binding protein, but I bet the DNA binding protein is regulated by something called a kinase, which is an enzyme that adds uh, phosphate groups to proteins. And he said, there are lots of drugs against kinases. I'm going to search all the kinases and see if any of them are required for BCA11A activity and stability. So Gerd Blobel, who's <laughs> he's Gunter Blobel's nephew. Gunter Blobel is a famous uh, molecular biologist who won the Nobel Prize. And Gerd uh, is a, a younger molecular biologist. Um, Gunter Blobel passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and Gerd works in Philadelphia. And he did this CRISPR-based screen, which just means you use CRISPR to, to test each kinase at a time. So druggable kinases. And he tested, there's about a thousand druggable kinases. He tested every one of them. And he found a kinase called HRI, and this is published in Science a couple of years ago, uh, affects BC11A levels. So now he's working with two very important pharmaceutical companies to develop inhibitors for this kinase. In theory, that could be excellent, but we don't know how well those inhibitors will work and we don't know what side effects there might be. So we don't know whether or not this could be a cure, but I wanted to explain it to you because I think this work is, of Gerd's is so important. And if it is a cure, you know, it could come very quickly when it comes. But on the other hand, it may not work at all. Um, you know, it's still, it's still being worked on. So I'm getting close to the end now. Um, so we're all still working for other strategies. And I just wanted to show you about here in Australia. So that's my lab. And that's, we always try to put the Sydney Opera House in the background. So everyone knows exactly where we are. We took that um, late last year. And then Andrew Perkins, he also, uh, some of you will know Andrew. He's a clinician scientist, an excellent clinician scientist. He also worked in Harvard with um, Gerd Blobel and I, we were all in Stu Orkin's lab together. And Andrew's doing excellent work on um, sickle cell and related blood disorders. Steve Jane worked in Washington in National Institutes of Health with Art Nienhaus, and who was a leader in gene therapy for thalassemias and sickle cell. And Steve now is at Monash, as is Andrew. And John Rasco, who's here in Sydney, uh, John is a pioneer on gene therapy for blood diseases and has been involved in some of the biggest trials in Australia and globally. Um, and he's a very well-known scientist. So there's quite a few of us in Australia who are interested in this problem. And I think the research is excellent. Uh, and I'll just go to this, my second last slide now. So to me as a scientist, sickle cell is the most famous most abundant and best studied inherited disorder. Generations of search researchers have been working towards a cure, and I believe that one day we will have better tre treatments. In recent year, years, CRISPR genome editing is meant you can modify cells, but there's still this compl complicated procedure of having to get the bone marrow out, change it, get it back in. I hope that one day in the future, there will be drugs that turn on fetal globin, and I hope that they can be used in developing countries across the world, as well as in countries like Australia. Um, and perhaps there'll be a drug, or perhaps you might be able to inject CRISPR for in vivo 
gene editing, although none of us know if that's safe. And I'd also say the health system in Australia, clinician scientists like Andrew, Steve, Jane, um, John Masco, we have some of the best clinician scientists and clinicians in the world. We do not have the scale of research uh, that they have in the US, but we do have the quality and we collaborate. I collaborate with um, Gerd and other people. Um, I've got my lab website, which talks about what la uh, lab life's like um, in, on our blog. Uh, I've got Twitter and I just want to show, I never, this, the last conference in Oxford, 2018, those are all the researchers who've basically dedicated their life to this problem at Warwick Castle for the dinner. I actually missed that dinner because I had to come back for something, but I did go to the rest of the conference. And that just gives you a picture. These are the people who meet every second year. Okay, it's 8.40 now. I think I'm pretty close to time. Now I have to find out how to stop sharing my screen. It's just up here. So I'll do that now and hand back to you, Agnes. Agnes, I think you're on mute. I have to unmute you. Yes, <laughs> I just saw that. <laughs> I was saying thank you so much for, for that nice presentation. I won't take too much of our time. I will straight on dive into asking Dr. Trigenza and Natalie to uh, ask questions. Then we are going to ask Lorna to speak a few minutes after that. Sarah, please. Fantastic. Um, thanks so much, Merlin, and thanks to everyone who dialed in. Um, as Agnes briefly mentioned earlier on, I'm a board member and scientific advisor for ASCA. Um, and so my background is also in science, a PhD in science similar to Merlin, but I currently work in industry. So um, I'm really passionate about bringing new therapies to market to meet unmet patient needs, which is really the focus of um, Merlin's talk today in the sickle cell um, disease space. So thank you again. Uh, We've got a question box. So if anyone wants to shoot through questions, feel free to do that. And Natalie and myself um, can pose those to Merlin. But I thought I might start um, with one of my own questions and something I think that came through previously or similar to what came through previously in email. Um, and that is, so a lot of the treatments at the moment work by uh, turning on fetal hemoglobin. And you mentioned in your talk, um, Merlin, they found that early on that people who had high levels of fetal hemoglobin as children and even as adults um, had less symptoms. So uh, I guess the, the question is, you mentioned that fetal hemoglobin has a high capacity to carry oxygen, and that's why it's uh, useful, obviously, in, in young children and babies. Um, so could there be actually any positive uh, benefits to having um, fetal hemoglobin as an adult, um, or alternatively, are there any adverse side effects you think from having fetal hemoglobin expressed as an adult rather than normal adult um, globin? So that's a great question, and I've had that question before. So uh, you might think it might have some advantages because it binds oxygen so well. But if it binds oxygen too well, it might not release oxygen to the muscles quite as well. So it might be a disadvantage. The other disadvantage you might think is that if it binds oxygen so well, then when the baby is in utero, it might not be able to get any oxygen from the mother's blood because uh, both the mother and the baby have got the same fetal hemoglobin. It turns out that a study was done on mothers who had uh, extra fetal hemoglobin and there were no negative side effects uh, noted. So then you might say, why has evolution given us two globins if it doesn't make that much difference? Mm -hmm. And it must make a tiny difference, but not much. But all organisms, <laughs> mice, chickens, lizards, fish, they all have different globins when they're in an egg from when they're an adult. So evolution seems to, there must be some difference, but it's not enough difference that in the modern world anyone notices it. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and I believe Natalie might have another question as well from the patient carer perspective. Mute. <laughs> I'm mute, Natalie. <laughs> I forgot about that, okay. Um, so I just introduced myself. My name is Natalie Kapuya and I'm a board member of ASCA as well. So Agnes and I have been friends for quite a long time. 
I do have a personal vested interest in uh, sickle cell disease, and uh, I'm really excited about this talk, uh, hearing about the latest research. I think uh, any talk of research always brings hope. And uh, I'll jump into a uh, question that I have. Uh, the question that has come in is, that, um, is there any research being done on the sickle cell trait? Because certain carriers have reported suffering from similar symptoms to sickle cell disease. And, you know, obviously because when they get tested and uh, generally sickle cell carriers, uh, sickle cell trait carriers are seen as asymptomatic, uh, not much um uh, medical care or treatment really goes into that so i'm just wondering you know what um is the state of that because i'm also aware that uh when you are a sickle cell trait carrier uh when it comes to certain altitudes for example you know, at certain altitudes such people are affected you know and then present uh with sickle cell disease i, I believe agnes probably uh had the same experience Thank you. Yes, so that makes perfect sense, Natalie. Yeah, it, it doesn't, I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me. So it is slightly mysterious that sickle cell disease is variable between different people. And part of that, the explanation is that different people have different levels of BCL11A. But part of it is there must be other genes that we don't know about that also influence how severe sickle cell is. And then likewise, if someone has sickle cell tray, some people might have some disease and some uh, no noticeable symptoms. So there's a lot of variation in the population related to other genes. Now there's another gene like BC11A also involved in repressing fetal globin. So there could be slight variations in those genes that could affect severity. And then there's many other things that might affect severity. So I think it doesn't surprise me at all that someone with sickle cell trait could sometimes have disease, uh, some symptoms. And, uh, but I don't know, um, you know, the only advice I could give is, yeah, to talk to the clinicians about it, because I think they would understand this issue and be able to offer the same sort of treatments to people who had uh, sickle cell disease. And I think we've got um, another question from an audience member here, Robin. Um, so Robin from Melbourne has asked, has there been any work carried out on hyperhemolysis syndrome in sickle cell patients? So that's a question that I have to show my ignorance and say, I do not know. <laughs> it's best I don't even attempt to answer that because I just am not aware of that research. Yep, no problem. Can I, um, I've got a question I received from email yesterday and uh, sorry, it's a bit long, but I'll read it all. I think I sent it to you last night, Malin. Um, it says, um, yeah, I'd like to ask, um, the professor about the efficacy and long-term side effects of hydroxyurea. I'm not sure whether, but I'll ask anyway. Um, hydroxyurea, which has been used since the 90s. In the 90s, our London immunologist was not too confident about the drug and wanted to give it 20 years uh, trial and see how it goes. It seems to me that something that alters the mechanism of DNA to stop producing adult blood, making it instead produce fetal blood must have side effects. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's the main question. I sent it to you last night. I don't know that you had a look at it. No, I didn't see that. Sorry, so I must have missed that. But I think, look, I think, it, again, we have to direct people back to uh, clinicians for that. Hydroxyurea, as, as, as is actually in the question, it's been used for a long time. Um, like all drugs, I know that there are side effects. Uh, it works well for some patients. It works less well for other patients. And that's also true of um, all other drugs. And it's to do with, um, you, you will have heard of personalized medicine. People are sort of realizing that everyone has slightly different gene variants and some drugs 
work well. Some drugs cause side effects in some patients. So it's an individual thing that I think has to be worked out with the individual doctors. But it, it is a drug which um, has been used widely for many people. Hi, Melanie. Hey. Sal, <laughs> I saw you were on the board and I, I felt so bad I didn't put you on the last slide. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I just wanted to ask. Uh, so, uh, to dive in. Please introduce yourself because you are part of ASK as well, quickly. Okay, sure. Um, my name is Xiao, Xiao Hoon. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, one of the board members, the scientific advisors for ASCA. Um, I used to work in uh, the Globin field, which is why I know Merlin. Um, I now work, I still work as a researcher, but I work on pediatric brain cancers at Monash University. So I'm not directly involved in the Globin field, but I have a background in it. So um, Merlin, I know you talked a lot about uh, using the new therapies to try to relieve BCL11A. I'm just wondering if there's still ongoing gene therapies focused on gene replacement, if you're aware of any of that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the reason I didn't put it in, it would have just made the talk longer. <laughs> so, but it's a great question. So what I was referring to is the first idea was the sickle cell mutation disables the normal adult globin gene. Why don't we just put in a new adult globin gene? And John Rasco had a paper, I think, in New England Journal of Medicine last year, where they'd successfully done that in about 10 patients with thalassemia. And I believe that's been successfully done in a patient with sickle cell anemia now. So you can, I think that that might be a therapy. And Stu Orkin had an article in Science or Nature uh, commentary about four years ago that said doing that was very expensive. It's You have to make a lot of um, vector. Uh, you have to, again, take the bone marrow cells out, add the vector, get the DNA in, put the bone marrow cells back in. But economically, it was worthwhile. And because it was worthwhile economically, he was confident it would happen. Everyone knew it was worthwhile for patients. Uh, so those, those, uh, that approach still exists. Um, and it's really a question of whether it's scaled up uh, in the gene therapy trials in America. And I think it's a really interesting question because you will have noticed from my talk, there were almost too many different options. And it takes a long time to really do trials and make sure one's safe. And it may well be that this replacement vector um, trial is what ends up being one of the best therapies. So it's an excellent question, but I'd type it to talk emerging therapies because that other one's been around for a while. Over. <laughs> Back to you, Agnes, or, or Sarah. Is, 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 yeah. Do we have time for one more question? I think, um, I think one more, then we hand over to, to Lorna quickly to speak two words. Okay. I'll go, I'll go quickly then, Melon. Um, so I guess one of my questions, and I thought maybe, because I don't work on CRISPR myself, but I know gene editing is kind of the next phase of therapies for a range of diseases, um, something close to market in some diseases. And I guess I was just curious, you mentioned CRISPR has worked for other diseases, but not for sickle cell, um, because it's based on cut and repairing genes, which we can't do in the globin stem cells. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so I guess I was just curious a bit more about that, because then you mentioned we might be able to do the in vivo injections at some point. Are you able to take us through, I guess, in more lay terms, um, why it doesn't work in sickle cell and why it might work if there's a, a possible injection um, later on? Yeah, so the only reason it doesn't work at the moment in stem cells is because the first generation CRISPR, you have to cut the gene and then you have to use the existing uh, DNA repair to homologously recombine your repair template. So, and that pathway doesn't seem to be highly active in blood stem cells, excuse me. But once, once we start using base editing, 
we don't need that second pathway. So once the base editors are developed, it should be possible to do it. But the first base editor couldn't actually do the base change required. So some of them work on A's, some of them work on C's, some work on T's, some work on G's. And the particular mutation, the first base editors couldn't do that, but prime editing can do that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Just okay. looking at time now, I think at this point, I'll quickly ask Dr. Lorna Speed uh, joining us from the US uh, to just quickly introduce herself. Lorna, are you still there? Yes, I am. And thank you so much, Professor Merlin. And it's been a real pleasure to hear and see the history. It's just amazing that uh, people have been working on this disease for so long. So my background is I'm a pharmacist from the UK and I did a PhD at Centre for Medicines Research, which got me into the pharmaceutical industry. So I'm a new medicine developer, but also getting drugs registered is my priority. And when I saw the needs for rare diseases, having worked on a number of rare diseases as well as neglected diseases, I set up a, a nonprofit called Putting Rare Diseases Patients First to provide patients with information or rare disease patients with information about new medicine developments about clinical trials and uh, that's what we do and we just started to focus put some more focus on sickle cell anemia after we received a grant uh, from Pfizer to provide that focus so we we did cover cures in a webinar that we ran just last week uh, with a number of different speakers and that webinar the recording will be available through facebook live actually in my time this morning 7 30 in the morning and then we'll run we'll run it properly next week we're just testing it this week through facebook live yeah. but hearing the history and seeing all the different challenges has, has really helped to uh, show the importance of this disease area and um it's really been a, a fascinating talk today and hopefully there'll be many more Nobel, Nobel Prize leaders uh, or winners and we'll see a, a real cure because at the moment patients have to go through the clinical trials, they have to be selected and it's not the sort of disease area that you can get compassionate use if you're not able to fit into a clinical trial. So a number of patients that have very severe disease and those might still not qualify for the clinical trials because they have to be in the media in the medium area not too severe and not too moderate or uh, mild in their disease and so we really want to impact more patients with cures but some patients are being cured at this time as so you want to make sure patients are able to ask the right questions and so i look forward to staying in touch with agnes really appreciate this uh, this invitation to take part today and we look forward to more collaborative um, work like this today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lorna. Natalie? Unmute. It's getting me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, I just have one more question uh, because you spoke about uh, the Australian environment obviously being different from the United States or the UK you know, in terms of scale. So are there, uh, for example, any collaborative initiative, particularly um, in targeted areas where people are most affected like Africa or uh, the Middle East, for example, are there any considerations for that? So that's very, it's a very good question. So this, the collaborators, we all collaborate all the time and we love collaborating. But really, the scale relates to the economic activity of the country. And the US has got the most research. Uh, China has a large number of uh, uh, hemoglobin apathies in southern China. And there's a lot of research going on there. Historically, it's been the UK too. There's, there's lots of talk uh, about, and I went to a genome editing conference about it's essential that all these cures, and they're talking about it with the COVID vaccine, that they be rolled out across the world, not just in the developed countries. And um, the Gates Foundation is providing some funding for um, research in this area, I understand, to ensure that it can, the, the treatments that are developed can be also de uh, 
rolled out across the world. So people are thinking about these things and trying, and that's one of the reasons to go for a drug because that'll be the most feasible way of doing it. So people are thinking about it, people are working on it. And there's some great scientists also in India, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, uh, uh, doing work as well and collaborating. So the answer is yes, there are numerous efforts in that direction. Over. Still on. <clears throat> okay, so Agnes, I'll take it over to you. I don't know if we have any more questions. Okay, Sarah, have you got any? We are on time actually, we should be wrapping up. Yeah. Anybody doesn't have any questions? Um, there was a question, I think, on the chat box. Oh, on the chat box, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think Oleander from London wanted to know if uh, any work has been done on people with sickle cell trait to stop the sickle cell before it's passed on. So that sounds like a germline, ed germ, germline editing. So that's interesting. Um, so, you know, that people, you can... Uh, have genetic counseling and you know people's uh, genotype can be they can ask to have their genotype tested uh, and then they can be you can do prenatal diagnosis and different individuals will make different choices or um, uh, governments in different country have enacted different laws with um, termination of pregnancy which sometimes occurs so there's um, there's that way genetic counseling which uh, does operate in many countries, including Australia. Uh, the germline gene editing, there's a real divide in the world about whether or not it is appropriate to do germline editing. And the conference I went to, it was fascinating. There were excellent researchers and philosophers on both sides, some which argued if you did germline gene editing so the trait couldn't be carried passed on, that in the long run is the best approach. And other people who said, no, germline gene editing is ethically wrong, so it must never be done. And I'll leave it with the audience to decide which of those both very fine arguments um, they, they accept. Over. Could, could I ask a question? Um, can, can you hear me? Yes, I can yes, hear yes, you. Can. Oh, great. Um, my daughter, Sophia, who is, I believe, a member of this advocacy um, uh, organization. She has what's called sickle beta thalassemia, which is a combination of both the sickle cell trait and the thalassemia trait. Um, so really she has these two traits, but they present in a way that she, she is symptomatic, like someone who has either thalassemia or sickle cell. Um, so she, there's something that happens at the DNA level, which is a little different. I don't quite understand it. Um, it's quantifiably different, but it, it's not, I'm not quite sure. So I won't go into it. You probably know more, obviously. Um, but she's on a treatment, um, of regular blood transfusions on a week, on a monthly basis. And of course, this has led to a huge iron overload. And, and uh, this is problematic because, well, you obviously know all the dangers of iron overload, but I'm particularly concerned with the dangers of the iron chelators. And I'm actually wading through the research at the moment to find out which are really the best chelators or are they all uh, leading to, um, you know, kidney damage and kidney failure? Are they, do they all lead to that and why? Um, and really what option does she have? Would she just, you know, would she just be a candidate for hydroxyurea? Is that really apart from the bone marrow transplant? I mean, there's no one on this panel that actually has sickle cell and it's a terribly debilitating thing. I've, and I've had to live with it. She lives with it. Um, it's very painful. So the transfusions have been a godsend. And I know some p 
people don't actually get them in other countries and I feel very sorry for them but uh, it's the iron collators which have me really worried and I, I was wondering whether you had anything to say about them. Um, so yeah. look that's a, that's a fascinating uh, situation and, and it is a and there are many patients, as you say, who have complex, um, uh, different changes. It sounds like one uh, chromosome has sickle cell and the other has a, a deletion in the adult beta gene. And this is not as uncommon as you might think. Um, so doctors are very experienced with that. The iron collators have got better and better. Um, but, you know, I just have to say, I really do believe the Australian clinicians are the best in the world. And I'm really not the best person to advise you on which are the best iron collators. And um, uh, but it is, but these the the therapies which are developed for sickle cell would also, I think, you know, be applicable to your daughter because it's uh, it's all the same family of um, uh, uh, changes in the adult beta globin gene. Over. Thank you. Can I just add? Sorry, can I just add something to yeah. Eleni? Good. So, um, can you hear me, Eleni? Yes, yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So you, the, that question, part of the questions, I've sent them through to our hematologist uh, scientific advisors. So we are going to get you detailed answers. And um, unfortunately, none of them could join us tonight. So I sent you a private message there. <laughs> I was Thank like, I've sent, I've sent through the questions to the doctors and they'll be able to answer in detail and I'll get back oh. to you. Thank you very much. That's, that's really good. I look forward to hearing about that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Crossley, have you got just time for one more question? <laughs> just one more. Can we have two? Because I've got one as well. <laughs> okay. okay, so this comes from uh, Robin Visakodeti from Melbourne, and he's asking whether, uh, has there been any work carried out on hyperhemolysis syndrome in sickle cell patients? Not it's very important that Agnes sends that to the clinicians. Oh, okay. I really don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. I had to, to try. I missed you. Yeah. Thank we'll you. send Thank all you. the other questions to, to the hematologist and we'll get back. Thank you. Isabel. Hi, Professor Merlin. I'm Isabella and I'm from Queensland. Um, I too have two children that have sickle cell beta thalassemia. Um, and one presents like a sickle cell patient, the other one presents like a thalassemia intermediate patient. Um, I guess my question to you would be, um, I hear you doing a lot of research with those people that do just have just sickle cell. Um, and then there's also other research that is just based on thalassemia major. Is the, the research that you are doing, is that also um, include those people that have the two haemoglobinopathies um, and as you were explaining before, um, I have two children, same parents. They both have a different genetic presentation. Um, how are you going with that kind of research? Or is it always only just based on the one? Yeah, that's a good question. But I think the answer is positive that the therapy of turning on fetal globin, one of My the- My children do have the fetal hemoglobin still. Yeah. It's good. That's right. So it, that therapy, if people manage to turn on fetal globin, it should cure or alleviate symptoms in all the different types of mutations, including, I would expect, but one can never tell, the ones your daughters have experienced. So, uh, so I would be optimistic that the cures would be applicable. And that's um, because... The fetal hemoglobin basically makes up for whatever has is not right with the adult globin. So, it, so, so these these treatments should be general. I, I would hope. You can never be absolutely sure, but I would be optimistic. Okay. So the other question then I do have is, what is the forecast um, with the research that you are doing um, as to how far away are we from um, getting um, these therapies in there? Isabella, I knew someone would ask that question. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's, the most, it's the most natural question in the world to ask. And I I've would been ask, asking it for a very long time. I would ask it the same. Yeah. And it's the same question as when will a COVID vaccine be available? Yeah, I understand that. I do understand that. But I thought but, I'd ask. <laughs> but it's, 
Yeah, the, the problem is that these processes of clinical trials take so long, but sometimes when it happens, it does happen quite quickly once everything is approved. And that's why I talked about the economics. I mean, I don't think human life should be more important than economics, but if the economics is on your side, things happen faster. Of course. I think we'll be wrapping it up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel from Queensland and everybody that has joined us um, on the panel. A big thank you to uh, Professor Crowsley um, for taking your time, uh, but also thank you to Natalie and, uh, and Sarah and Chow who are part of ASCA. So uh, again, we're emphasizing that if you've got any questions, just like Eleni's question, uh, send us, we're going to send it to our uh, hematologists and some that will apply to Professor Crowsley, we'll still send them Send them to our email um, at info at ocsicoceladvocacy.org or just um, you can shoot through um, um, maybe a phone call or text or anything. So um, for us, we thought this is a good way of interacting with every one of our members. I'm, I'm glad Isabella all the way from Queensland has joined us. Um, South Australia, Elena, and of course, South Wales. And I think we have another person who's also part of us, um, Ade in, um, Northern Territory, thanks for joining. And all the other um, participants who come on, thank you so much for joining. So look out for other sessions like this. We are hoping to bring these sessions almost every Friday. Um, but at this point, the next session that we have booked is on the 26th of June with a good friend of mine. And I will share quickly, just share the screen. So on the 26th, uh, we are going to do a session with uh, Daniel from the UK, he runs a, a foundation which is called Sickle Cell Welfare Forum. And um, he wants just to talk about what is done. Um, I like what he's doing at the moment. I think it's the only thing that I've heard of and he's going to explain to us what he's doing with um, people that are um, affected by sickle cell. And I like his quotation where he says, we have to get several aspects of an affected person's life to hear enough perfect so I thought, that was brilliant. He didn't even know when he was saying this that it really touched my heart. So we'll be doing that on the 26th of June. But of course, the most important thing that we are going to do the 19th of June when we have the, another event like this, we have over 100 participants. And we are going to have the World Sickle Cell Day on the 19th of June. And uh, that's the panelists, and Daniel is one of them as well. And we've got Sophia, who's um, Elena's daughter, and other people that are coming from different parts of the world. So join us for the 19th of June, similar event. Um, so again, just a big thank you again to everyone. A big thank you to Professor Closey. And um, yeah, we're going to wrap it up. Get in touch soon. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much, Agnes. Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Good to see you, Shell. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> we'll be in touch with more questions. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, okay. everyone.